Shona and the Water Horse by R. Chetwin Hayes Read by Hugh Carr Directed by Brendan James He came down from the moors, a tall, lean man with the face of a fallen angel and the haunted look of one who has seen much and forgotten little. It was somewhere between Glen Morriston and Glen Affric that he came upon the little village, a mere huddle of white cottages that clustered round the kirk like a litter of puppies nuzzling the flanks of their mother. He made straight for the manse, a tall, ugly building with two windows up and down, with a green door dead centre and an untidy front garden that had not felt the spade or fork for many a year. He hammered on the door with clenched fist, then stood waiting, his eyes fixed on the green panels with a strange, intense stare. Then, when the sound of approaching footsteps told him his summons was about to be answered, looked quickly back over one shoulder at the desolate moorlands. The door opened, and a young girl stood in the opening. She may have been twenty, perhaps younger, with the white skin of a seal maiden, full, moist lips, and black hair that framed her face like a storm cloud round a mountain peak. Large, dark eyes surveyed the stranger with cool insolence. Well, what is it you're wanting? A hint of the Highland brogue, but education had filed down the consonants to an attractive lilt. The minister, I must see him. The dark eyes swept down the tall figure, took in at one glance the long, lean, sun-tanned face, the green jacket to which bits of dried grass clung like cobwebs to a cellar wall, the worn corduroy trousers, the cracked boots. Do you suppose his reverence has nothing better to do than see the likes of you? He did not smile, but for a moment the cold grey eyes were lit by a gleam of amusement. Then it went out, and the girl, despite her self-confidence, involuntarily shuddered. A shepherd with such a small flock will find the time. Indeed. And who shall I say has done us the honour of calling? The water horse. The what? She began to giggle. Then something about the stern, handsome face, the unblinking eyes, made her stop. Tell him the water horse has words he wishes to speak. Well? She stood reluctantly to one side. You'd better come in. He stood in the small hall and waited while the girl entered a room on the left closing the door behind her. The murmur of voices came to him, one harsh, impatient, then the girls, soft, pouring appeasing oil on threatening, troubled waters. Presently, the door opened and she reappeared, a mischievous smile playing around her lips. My father will see you for a few minutes. He brushed by her and entered the little room. It smelled of damp, stale tobacco smoke and old books. A little bald-headed man glared up at him from behind a giant desk, then waved a short-fingered hand in the direction of an old, padded armchair. Shit you doon, man, shit you doon. From what my daughter tells me, you're either a madman or a fool. And as I haven't time to waste an either, say your peace or be off. The stranger lowered his length into the chair and folded his hands neatly on his flat stomach. A thick white down covered the backs of his hands, and the minister noted this peculiarity and frowned. No, who are you and what do you want? 
I am the water horse. The minister nodded slowly. So you know your Scottish mythology. As I recall, there was a Donald MacGregor who had a daughter named Morag, and she found a handsome stranger by the loch side, and being a loose lassie, she put his head on her lap and began to comb his thick black hair. It was the stranger's turn to nod. And in her comb were fine green strands of weed and grains of silt, and terror entered her soul, for she knew it was the dreaded water horse. The minister smiled grimly. A likely tale constructed to keep her father's belt around her waist, but not likely to find much credence with an educated man like myself. So you're an educated man, Angus Buchanan. Again, a hint of amusement lit the stranger's eyes. You have learnt one set of fables by heart, but deliberately ignored all others. But it is of little consequence to me what you believe. I am the water horse. You're soft in the head, man. The Reverend Buchanan leaned forward. Are you telling me you can change into, what is it, a great black stallion that gallops across the moor on a moonlit night, eh? Is that what you claim? I cannot cross running water, the stranger admitted. How do you manage then when you go down to the loch? The waters are still cool as a maiden's hinds, and it is quiet with the great peace, and one can dream away the centuries. You're as crazed as a crack jug, and I waste no more time with you, so get about your business, whatever it might be. But you haven't heard what I have to tell you. Nor do I want to. But you'll hear all the same. He rose to his full height and appeared to fill the small room. The Reverend Buchanan looked up, and for the first time a flicker of fear made him fall back into his chair. The stranger placed both his hands on the desk and leant forward. The clergyman saw at close quarters the flat planes of his cheeks, the delicate bones, the dark sinister, handsome face. I have come to tell you that Devil walks on the moor again, and he's looking for a titbit to blanch the keen edge of his appetite. The devil! The clergyman drew out the word devil, as though it had a sweet flavor, and he wanted to savor its taste for as long as possible. I... The tall figure became upright, and a set of magnificent teeth were bared in a mirthless grin. Year-old adversary, or very close relative, or maybe not, perhaps he is born of men's fears, the outcome of the evil they secretly desire, but he is real enough, and he wants your village, the old, the young, The good, the bad, the blackness, the grey, the white. The devil coming for the village? Angus Buchanan whispered the words. Then he looked up and a sly smile parted his lips. But if you are who you say you are, sure you're one of his minions. I seem to remember the water horse has two black horns on the top of his black head. I but pluck a single fruit when the desire is on me, the tall man said quietly, but he would consume the entire orchard, trees and all. And what would you have me do? the minister asked. Bolt your doors at sunset and paint a white cross on each panel. Above all, let no one go out on the moors after nightfall. I canna do it, man. Mr. Buchanan crashed his clenched fist down upon the desk. I canna pamper to superstitious nonsense. This is the twentieth century, not the dark ages, and I'll not make a fool of myself to please a crack brain stranger who I'm thinking ought to be locked away for his own good. Then you are a fool, 
The tall man's face was now harsh, and his eyes blazed with a terrible anger. I tell you, he will be here before sunset, and you will not know who he is. A traveller begging a bed for the night, a bonny boy with golden hair and laughing eyes, an old woman, a comely maiden, a stray dog, anyone, anything could be he. I've listened long enough to hear blasphemous nonsense. The clergyman also rose, pushing his chair back and glaring at the unwelcome stranger. You'll be getting me as crazed as yourself, so away with you. It's the truth I'm telling you. The stranger's voice rose to a shout. The plain truth that is staring you in the face, and you are blinded by ignorance, deafened by stupidity. Get out. I'll no be shouted at and insulted in my own house, so out with ye. The tall man nodded slowly. So be it. I have warned. Why, I do not know. But hear this. Before the sun rises again, you and all that live in this place will take the long walk, and the black hounds will shepherd you into the shadows. He strode to the door, opened it, and walked silently across the hall. At the front door, he turned suddenly and saw the girl watching him from the kitchen doorway. You are called Shona. It was a statement of fact, not a question. She nodded. How do you come to know my name? I know. You are the one apple he shall not pluck. I will come for you. After a while, Shona moved slowly to the doorway and stood watching the tall figure as it retreated along the dusty road. Her eyes were soft pools of dark wonder. Then she raised her voice and called after him. You need not bother. I'll no come with you. He did not turn his head or give the slightest indication that he had heard her. After a few minutes, Shona closed the door and stood with her back leaning against it. Sweet God, she whispered. I'll no go with him. I'll no go. Night had spread her black mantle across the moors when the Reverend Angus Buchanan sat down to dinner. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the food thou hast seen fit to place before us, for which we are truly thankful. Amen. Shona repeated. Amen. Then watched her father take up his knife and fork. Father, what did he want? Who? The minister helped himself to some more boiled beef. The man, the tall man. He was a poor mad creature, thinks he's a water horse of all things. Came to tell me the devil's loose on the moors and is coming to eat up the entire village for some such nonsense. The devil loose on the moors? The girl looked fearfully at the uncurtained windows, behind which swirls of mist were wandering like unformed ghosts. Do you think he could be? The devil is everywhere, the parson snapped. But not as some hundred monster skulking in the heather. Don't ask fool questions. I don't mean the Bible devil. But this land has seen so much violence, so much horror spread down over the centuries. Every glen has known the shriek of the murdered, the screams of the ravaged. Could not something, someone, have built up over the years? Perhaps in the beginning it might have been a relic of some past race, a different form of life as we know it, a skeleton that is now fleshed with the excrement of the human mind. That would be the devil, would it not, Father? I'll not have that kind of talk at my table, Mr. Buchanan roared. What's come over you, girl? You sound like that poor mad fool this afternoon. I'm fair ashamed of you, that I am. He said he was the water horse, the girl said softly. Aye, and next week he'll say he's Napoleon. 
Perhaps a water horse is a myth founded on fact. There's more water on Earth than there is dry land, and I've often wondered why intelligent life did not come from it. Because God in his wisdom decided otherwise, Mr. Buchanan commented dryly. No, if you've finished trying to drive me mad with your heathen talk, I'll ring for the pudding. He rang a little brass cowbell that stood near to hand, and, almost at once, Flora, a large, raw-boned woman, entered, bearing a steaming apple pudding on a silver tray. She placed it before the minister, who sniffed appreciatively, then frowned. You've forgotten the custard. Flora folded her arms. I know I forgot it. The milk curdled. Fresh this morning it was, straight from the cun's cow, and now it's only fit to make cheese, which I've no mind to do. But an apple pudding without custard is like a mother without buns, the minister complained. The milk couldn't have been fresh. I'm telling you, the milk was as fresh as a daisy on the May morning. You'll have to eat it the way it was made, and that's all there is to it. By the by, there's a woman by the kitchen door who wants to know if she can sleep here the night. I said I'd ask you, and I have. This is no an inn, Mr. Buchanan stated. And if it was, she'd no have the money to pay, I'm thinking. A poor, starved body by the look of her. A jippo, most likely. She'll be content with a blanket in the barn. She seeks my hospitality. Mr. Buchanan stressed his point by tapping a forefinger on the table. No guest of mine sleeps in the barn. Make up a bed in the room over the stables. It's warm and dry up there, and see the poor soul get something hot inside her. Shona got up and put on her outdoor coat, which had been lying on a nearby chair. The minister looked at her with rising indignation. Where are you going? Sit down and eat your pudding. I promised to drop in on Sarah Edgemont. She's that poorly, and thought I'd clear up for her, maybe cook her a bit of a meal. She can wait till after you've eaten your pudding. I couldn't. Father, honestly, I'm full up. She made her escape, ignoring Mr. Buchanan's roar of rage, and Flora shrugged while she removed the used plates. One word from you, and that lassie does as she pleases. Mind your business, women, Mr. Buchanan glared at his housekeeper. At least she concerns herself with good works, and no gads about like some could mention. Fat chance she'd have in this forsaken place. It's no wonder the young folk break their apron strings and away so soon as they're of age. When Flora had left the room, the minister laid down his fork and spoon, rose and went over to his armchair, where he sat staring pensively into the fire. Somewhere, a dog began to howl, a mournful cry as though some lost soul were being tormented in a mist-shrouded hell. Mr. Buchanan shivered, then leant forward and poked the fire. The flames leapt up, made shadows dance a mad reel across the walls and ceiling were reflected in the window panes, and the minister found himself looking back over one shoulder. My nerves, he muttered. I'm getting old. He got up and walked over to his desk, took up his large, black-bound Bible, and returned to his chair and opened the volume at the Book of Revelation. He read aloud, as was his custom. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent that is called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The Reverend Angus Buchanan 
closed his Bible, then resumed his study of the fire. The dog howled again, and now the cry was taken up by another, and the minister started when the door opened, and Shona entered. For heaven's sake, lassie, you fell made me jump out my skin, creeping in like that. You haven't been long. How is Mrs. Edgemond? Shona did not answer, but seated herself on a chair opposite and stared at him with bright eyes. Her white skin was paler than usual, and her black hair was beaded with moisture. The full, red lips were parted, and the smile appeared to have been etched into her face, suggesting some secret knowledge that only she knew. The minister frowned. Have you lost your tongue, gal? I asked you. How did you find Mrs. Edgemont? And why are you back so early? I thought you were going to cook her a meal. She continued to sit perfectly still. But the smile had now taken on a faintly mocking aspect. The fire flared up, then gradually died down until there was only a mass of glowing embers. The minister became aware of an increasing coldness, and he shivered. Outside, there was now a growing chorus of howling dogs. The fire, he muttered, is not drawing as it should, and the cold is getting into my bones. He seized the poker and stirred the embers. A few solitary sparks shot up the chimney, but the fire still refused to blaze. Let me feed it. Her voice was only an octave above a whisper, when the minister jerked his head round as though stung by a wasp. The smile was now blatantly mocking, and a hitherto unknown dread made him tremble. What do you mean, lassie? She rose in one graceful movement, and it seemed that she had suddenly grown levacious. Her dress was strangely loose and appeared reluctant to cover the curves of her breasts. As she moved, it slid off one shoulder, and her eyes were now black with an eerie intelligence. Give me the book. The night was hideous with the howling of dogs. The wisps of mist were seeping in round the edge of the window. Shona's smile was now a grimace. Give me the book. She laid one white hand upon the Bible, and for a brief second, her little finger touched his wrist. A blast of burning ice ran up his arm. His grip slackened, and instantly, she snatched the Bible and tossed it onto the fire. He was so paralyzed with terror, he could only watch the flames as they licked the tooled leather, then turned the gilt-edged pages first brown, then black. You're mad, girl, mad. She laughed, a full, raucous, bellowing laugh, a sound that was not natural to that slender throat. Then, spinning round on one heel, she performed an obscene dance, and her shadow, brought into being by the blazing Bible, caracoled across the opposite wall and over the ceiling. Gradually, the dance grew more wild. Her dress was high up above her waist, and the speechless clergyman saw white thighs, breasts that had escaped from their confinement. Then she suddenly stopped and froze the minister to his chair with a burning stare. 
Who am I, old man? The incarnate himself? Or a sick dream created by the frustrated desires of a lifetime? Or am I your daughter revealing her true face? Mr. Buchanan tried to speak before unconsciousness claimed him and he sank into a black pit of unawareness. Father! Father! Shona was bending over him. A basin was on the table by her side, and a damp cloth was lying on his forehead. Father, what's wrong? I couldn't wake you when you came in. Flora, she said, turning to the housekeeper. Why is he looking at me like that? Why doesn't he speak? I didn't know, but I don't like the look of him. Flora shook her head. I'm thinking we ought to fetch the doctor. But he was all right when I left, just a little peeved because I went out before eating the pudding. She laid her hand on the minister's shoulder, and the effect was terrifying. He twisted wildly as though he'd been touched with a hot iron, and his eyes blazed with a light that could have been caused by either anger or fear. He tried to speak, but only succeeded in making a strange hoarse sound that had a duck-like quality, and with his left hand he pushed away the girl so that she fell against the table, upsetting the basin. I'll fetch the doctor, Flora said, backing away a while, watching the clergyman vainly attempting to rise. I didn't like this at all. But what's wrong with him? Shona was near tears. Why does he keep looking at me like that? I can't tell. Perhaps his poor brain is crazed, though more likely he's had a stroke. But one thing's for sure, he can't stand the sight of you. Flora fled, and the sound of her retreating footsteps was the rout of sanity. Shona approached the figure that sprawled in the familiar armchair and stretched out her hand. The figure writhed, emitted a strangled scream and Shona withdrew, walking backwards with both hands clasped to her trembling lips. Dr. Ross was a short, red-haired man with matching face and bristling mustache. He bustled into the room, dumped his black bag on the table, then sank down on one knee beside the prostrate clergyman. What ails eh, man, eh? You say hail and hot, eh? You boast to never need my services. Mr. Buchanan made another raucous sound and moved his left hand in the direction of Shona, who gasped as though she'd been hit. Dr. Ross frowned. There's no need to frighten the lass. She bonny and dutiful, as ye well know. Can ye understand what I'm saying? Mr. Buchanan nodded. Then listen carefully. You've had a wee stroke. But with rest, you should be right as rain. Flora and I will make you up a bed on yon sofa, and Shona, like the good lass she is, will minister to you. So let's have no more nonsense, or I'll give you the rough edge of my tongue. The sick man began to jerk his head from side to side. Then, in an effort to stress his wishes, pointed a trembling finger at Shona. Dr. Ross looked back at her, an expression of growing suspicion on his face. Is there aught I should know, Shona? No, she shook her head. I don't understand. When I left him to visit Mrs. Edgemont, he was finishing his dinner. And when I came back, he was like this. You were with Sarah Edgemont the whole time? You never came out and did anything that your father may have seen? No, I swear, Sarah will back me up. Well, there's something bothering him, that's for sure. You better keep out of his sight till he's more himself. Flora will help me. Shona wandered miserably out into the kitchen, where, prompted by some half-formed wish to be of use, she filled the kettle and placed it on the black iron range then went over to a cupboard and took out a brown earthenware teapot. The woman 
was seated by the window, quietly watching her. Shona gave a little cry. Who are you? Guest. Oh. Shona pushed back a strand of hair from her forehead. You're the woman that father said could spend the night in the stable room. I am. The woman looked up, smiling, her face thin, with a pointed chin and beautiful, slanting green eyes. She had a mass of red hair, so brightly did it shine, Shona thought it looked like red gold. She said warily, You look so thin. I never get enough to eat. I'm sorry. Shona looked around with a helpless air. Flora should have given you something, but my father has been taken ill, and... She fed me, said the woman, but not with the food I hunger for. She got up and moved across the kitchen. Her walk was a kind of flowing movement, rather like a snake that is sighted, a succulent prey. And her long, tapering hands were never still, constantly smoothing the bedraggled dress, fingering any object that came within their grasp. A cup, a knife, eventually, Shona herself. The girl involuntarily shrank back when the soft, cold fingers caressed her arm and pleaded plaintively, Please, don't. But you have such smooth, white skin. The green eyes were but a few inches from her own, and the voice was low, vibrant, stirring up thoughts, desires, that up till then, Shona did not realize existed. Smooth as a seal maiden that is played in the waters of some northern sea and is only flooded with the sun. Do you dream, child? You should dream of a throne of ice, dream of a star diamond necklace around your neck and a moon ring on your finger and a laurel of sea lilies kissing your black hair. Please stop. Shona pulled an arm free and put the kitchen table between her and the red-haired woman. Who are you? What do you want? The woman leant against the wall and smiled so very gently. For the first, I am known by many names. But for the present, you may call me Hianshi. He and she, Shona repeated. Yes, I think that describes my present position very neatly. As for the second, I want your white soul. You must be mad, Shona whispered. Who isn't? Madness is a delightful form of sanity. What else would I want but your soul? I will make it a pretty plaything. There can be no argument. I must have your soul. Flora bustled into the kitchen, but she now wore the air of one who has to deal with an exciting crisis, and she brushed Shona aside with an impatient wave of her arm. Out of my way, I've got my hands full with what you poor feather the way he is, and the doctor demanding hot water to be made hot compressors for or some such thing. How is he? Shona asked. He seems to be asleep, which should do in the power of good. I'm going to make myself up a bed next to his in case he needs anything. Can I help? Shona pleaded. The doctor said you're not to go near him in his present state, and it's best you don't. No, no, don't carry on so. She clasped the sobbing girl in her powerful arms, patting her awkwardly on one shoulder. Then suddenly her face was transformed by a ferocious scowl. 
What are you grinning at, you brazen hizzy? The red-haired woman sauntered across the room, her hips swinging, a sly smile parting her lips. I was thinking, a gazelle in the arms of a she-bear. Away with you to the stables where you belong, or no have you in my kitchen. And be gone before daybreak, or I'll have the law on you for trespassing. She frightens me, Shona whispered once the woman had gone. Flora, is it true the devil can take any shape? I would no know, lassie, but if what the old folks say is true, he could, aye, he could. The water horse told father he was loose on the moors. The water horse? I've never heard such nonsense. He was tall, with the face of a fallen angel. And father said that he was mad. Shona sighed and walked over to the window. Look how thick the mist has become. I can scarce see across the road. They say the ghosts of Prince Charlie's men go marching across the moors when the mist is thick, and the grey dog of Morard goes hunting for lost travellers. She turned suddenly, her eyes black pools of terror. Flora, the devil is in the village. No, no, child, you're upset. And who's to wonder what with your father struck down and that jippo woman frighten you? Why not go to your room and try to sleep? I'll wake you if anything happens. How can I sleep? She hugged her elbows and bowed her shoulders as though in pain. Listen, the dogs have started to howl again. I can understand why old wives say a howling dog foretells a death. It is the most mournful sound under God's sky. Tis the mist, Flora said. They cannot see clearly. Then one starts barking and sets the other off. Come away from the window, then go lie yourself down. I will. Shona began to walk towards the kitchen door. Then, when she had reached the table, suddenly stopped. You know what I really wish, Flora? No. I wish... I wish I could believe in the water horse. But he is a fearsome kelpie, and he only takes fair form as to lure honest folk to their doom. You wouldn't want any truck with a great beastie like that. But he wouldn't harm me, Flora. I know he wouldn't. He said he would come back for me. Aye, they all say that. Flora began to shepherd her out of the kitchen and up the steep stairs. You rest yourself and forget all about water horses and men that will no come back. They never do. Oh, the bonny men I've known all said they'd come back, but they didn't. Ne'er one. She made the girl lie down on her narrow bed and after removing her shoes, covered her with a blue counterpane then leant over her and kissed her white forehead. You should be among bright lights and young folk, not here. The old can be selfish, but the good Lord sees all. Many a curse is a blessing in disguise. She crept from the room, leaving a small night light burning by Shona's bed, and the girl lay watching it, deriving a childlike comfort from the tiny flame. The dogs had ceased to howl, and now and again, not far away, she heard the deep bay of a hound and smiled, remembering the legend of the Mora dog. Then sleep crept up unawares, and a dream came into being. The great black stallion came up from the loch water streaming from his sable hair, and she saw the two black horns that grew up from the top of his head. She felt no fear as he advanced towards her. Rather, there was a throbbing joy when he bent his dark head so that she could caress his soft mane. I will come for you, he said and we would dream together beneath the loch. Suddenly, 
Shona found herself astride the broad back, clinging with both hands to the black mane, and the wind was singing a wild song as it tried to keep up with them, and all around, from the racing ground to the starlit heavens, came the thudding roar of the water horse's pounding hoofs. Louder and louder it grew, until the moor shook and the stars trembled against the blue-black sky, and fear rode in on the singing wind. The village, she screamed, the village will fall. She sat up, and the thudding sound was still in her ears. The nightlight was trembling, the window shook like some caged thing trying to break free. Then with a crash, the casement burst open, and the milk-white mists poured in. The thudding became a continuous roar. The house shook. A shower of plaster fell from the ceiling, while from beyond the gaping window, she could hear the fall of masonry and a rising chorus of screams. She slid from her bed and stumbled to the door. Then came a nightmare journey down the trembling stairs, the woodwork emitting a series of protesting groans. They held out until she reached the hall, then collapsed with one last despairing shriek, and Shona saw Flora dragging Mr. Buchanan through the study doorway. The floor shook again, and Shona had one glimpse of the old man's face. His head was bent backwards between Flora's straddled legs, and his eyes glared with fear and anger as she crouched on the heaving floor. She cried out, Father! Father! Then the walls caved in, the roof came down, and for a while there was only a blessed forgetfulness. Shona came out into what had been the single dusty road and looked about her with wide-eyed horror. Every house was a heap of rubble. Flames were growing up from some of the ruins like scarlet flowers on the graves of the damned. The wind was singing a dirge as it plucked at her dirt-grimed dress, as though trying to pull her away from this Golgotha. The mist had gone. A great yellow moon gazed down in cold disdain. The stars twinkled like diamonds on black velvet. Then the wind finished its song and departed with a final sigh. The ruined village, the surrounding moors, the distant hills, all save for the crackling flames, were still, silent, eternal. Shona walked to the village boundary, far away, but quite distinct in the bright moonlight. She saw a long line of figures limping with bowed heads towards the horizon. Great black hounds were prowling back and forth on either side, and it seemed she could see a tall woman leading a little old man by the hand. But try as she could, Shona felt no grief no regret. There was the sound of approaching footsteps, and the red-haired woman was walking daintily along the village street, carefully stepping over debris, looking to neither right or left, and as she walked she discarded the tattered dress, reaching up and tossing aside the red-gold hair and it was a tall, slim, young man clad in a black satin suit who stopped a few feet from the white-skinned girl. Ah, he said softly, the stray lamb. 
His hair was as black as a starless night. His eyes were polished emeralds. And his beauty was that of a snake. He laughed softly and shone a thought of green poison gurgling in tall glasses. You may call me he now. I am all things to all people. Why did you do it? She asked. You mean this? He glanced around the devastated village. Had to. No reason, just had to. A mere earth subsidence. They will talk about it for years. The long-haired men with spectacles will explain it away in a single hour. The opposition will get the credit. An act of God. And me? Ah, he smiled, and his white teeth gleamed like ivory set in pink coral. I promised you a throne of ice and a star diamond and yes, a moon ring for your finger. I have never been known to break my word, though I do bend it sometimes. He drew closer, placed his arms around her body and the dust grime dress floated away like a leaf falling from a white flower. His mouth was the universe, his eyes eternity, and his lips the doorway to hell. She gave one loud cry. What a horse! He released her and laughed. The galloping hero. I had forgotten him. Now, where can he be? Here. The water horse stood a few feet away, still dressed in the green jacket and corduroy trousers. His face was expressionless. Ha! An ex-employee, an absconded servant, a dream made from superstition and fear. Is this what you want? Shona did not answer, and the water horse spoke. She is the one apple ye will not pick. He backed away a few steps, and his green eyes were slits of emerald fire. I draw my strength from earth, fire, and brutality. Would you dare? The water horse raised his hands. My strength comes from wind and still water. Neither will break. I dare. They began to circle each other, both with hands outstretched, fingers curved, moving slowly at first, each one looking for an opening in his adversary's guard before attacking. Then he sprang, a streak of blackness, and the two figures were locked, hands clawed at throats, bared teeth gleaming white in the moonlight, and the night was hideous with their guttural screams. Shona turned her head away and saw that the burning ruins were now so many heaps of glowing embers. Every brick, stone, beam was bright red and little spirals of smoke drifted up into the blue-black sky. The two monstrous shadows began to dance across the blackened ground two great slabs that came together, twisted, parted, elongated, then became squat blobs of pure horror. Shona turned her head and screamed. He was now a towering giant, all of twelve feet tall, a black face with slanting green eyes, red tapering ears, black curls from which sprouted two red horns. His body was covered with green scales, as also was a thick lashing tail, and his long red 
talons were trying to slash his adversary's face. This was how man had always imagined him. The epitome of horror, the essence of evil, the prime evil skeleton fleshed with the excrement of the human mind. The great dragon that the gods had thrown out. And the water horse, he was as Shona had dreamed. A mighty black stallion, his sable coat gleaming like the loch in moonlight, his eyes grey mists veiling twin suns, his forelock a figure of white hair that could have been plucked from the beard of Odin. He reared up on his hind legs and crashed his hoofs into the face of he, the incarnate, the fallen one, the morning star. And the great dragon fell, twisted over, then leapt onto the black, gleaming back. His talon feet dug into the heaving flanks. His hands gripped the strong, graceful neck, and with a scream, the water horse crashed to the ground then rolled over in an effort to dislodge the fiend on his back. Then he twisted his neck and Shona watched the great teeth sink into the green scaled neck. The incarnate screamed, a dreadful rasping sound that rang out across the moor, causing grey shadows to go floating over the heather. As the teeth sank deeper and blood flowed down over the heaving torso, the scream grew fainter. The hideous figure became thinner, and presently the water horse released a green and red flecked snake. It writhed into the heather and disappeared from view. The water horse stood for a little while, trembling, drawing great gulps of air through its flaring nostrils, bright red streaks marring the beauty of its sable coat. Then it poured the ground and gave vent to one mighty roar of triumph. Shona walked very slowly towards him, still a little fearful. But he was as motionless as a great shadow, and her white, naked body stood out against the blackness like a slab of moonlight in a darkened room. Let me come with you, water horse, she whispered. He did not move, and she timidly stroked his head. Then her hand went up, gripped his black mane, and in one graceful movement, she swung up onto the broad, gleaming back. The pounding hoofs made the earth tremble. The wind resumed its mad song. The ghosts of the long dead drifted like thistle down across the moor, and the loch shone like a silver tray a little way ahead. Oh, sweet God, Shona cried. What is reality? Who are the dead? Production, sound design and editing by Brendan James. Please support the Black Dog Chronicles by liking this video, sharing on your favorite social media, and subscribing. As always, we thank you for listening. This is Hugh Carr. Is it possible that you are missing out on new editions of the Black Dog Chronicles? <sighs> Oh no! Don't despair. Simply remember to click the notification bell next to the subscribe button on our channel. Never miss another edition of the Black Dog Chronicles again.